Well, hello there, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bokori, your host for episode 107. Thanks very much for taking the time to join me today. Back to the new style shows. Got a few, uh, actually quite a few articles I'm going to talk about today. So let me just get right to it. First story I'm going to talk about is global plug-in sales. Uh, you folks know I always like to track the numbers. Now, these are numbers from the end of July. I don't have anything since then. I did talk about the first half of the year. The promising stats about July that the numbers are climbing, so they actually look pretty good. Uh, it was 248,000 units that were sold, and that's the fourth best, the fourth best monthly result ever for plugins globally. So that's pretty cool. That's a 76% year-over-year improvement, and uh, it takes market share up to sub 4%. But of course, there's a 7% decline in the overall auto and light vehicle marketplace, so that uh, makes it uh, seem stronger than it is. Um, no surprise, the top uh, all-electric vehicle or the top plug-in vehicle globally, Tesla Model 3, with uh, just uh, over 22,000 units sold in July, bringing it its total year-to-date of just under 165,000. Just as an FYI, the uh, uh, Model 3 that I got last week, the VIN number was in the 880,000 range. So it just shows you where they are now going into the middle of part of September from where they were end of July. So you can do the math there. That's pretty good. Tesla, of course, being still the number one brand out there. Again, no surprise with uh, just over 212,000 uh, models, and that's combined models uh, for the Tesla, combined uh, trims and everything that they have. And then again, that's end of July, so it's a month and a half old by now, so you can add some more numbers to that, but they're tracking good. VW is doing quite well at uh, over 77,000, and then BMW and others round them out. So uh, good to see, and uh, again, I'll continue to track the numbers as we go forward. I'm going to talk briefly about General Motors GM. Now, they are offering the first wireless battery management to help scale their Ultium EV technologies. Um, and why is that important? I think we've all seen the Ultium stuff now through GM uh, EV Day and all the announcements that they've had coming out. But this is something where it's a technology that they want to implement across the different brands uh, with different cell modules and module configurations. And it, basically what it does is it saves them from all the, the a lot of the internal wiring that goes into these battery packs. So if you want to design a pack for a subcompact versus a midsize versus a pickup truck, uh, all the wiring and everything needs to be redesigned because typically those packs are different sizes, right, to accommodate different batteries, uh, formats, and so forth. Well, if you can do a lot of that wirelessly and minimize the wired components, um, it can really save up, uh, uh, reduce the number of wires in the battery by up to 90%, according to GM. And what that can do is also help future-proof battery systems because it enables bad new battery chemistries in the future uh, to be implemented to production mod models uh, by merely changing out the modules. So you don't have to do all that rewiring again for a lot of the BMS because of the wireless components. Um, and it may even offer permissions later on in the future for owners to do battery swaps as well, like going to a certified place to get it out, uh, as an example. Get your module swapped out with a maybe a higher density battery pack, or who knows. Um, and plus, it also offers increased OTA uh, capabilities and increased security that is implemented for the wireless to safeguard anybody hacking into it. So um, that's about all I have to say about that. Keep your eyes on GM for more announcements. I'm sure that they're going to milk this for all it's worth just to show that they're they are engaged in technologies, but that's good, folks. We, we want the competition. We want all the OEMs to really get uh, excited about uh, battery technologies and EVs and develop more future technologies to help consumers get into it and buy them. Staying on GAM, General Motors, uh, they are now going to be the official manu manufacturing partner for the Nikola Badger uh, pickup truck. Um, it was first thought to be Fiat Chrysler, uh, but not going to happen. GM has stepped in. They've actually thrown some money, uh, about 11% or $2 billion a stake in, uh, in Nikola's They've invested in Nikola to be part of these uh, partnerships. And uh, what they're saying is in-kind contributions, sharing R&D, technologies, all this kind of stuff. The Badger will use GM's Altium batteries. That has been confirmed, and which is great for Nikola because it expects them to save about a billion bucks in engineering and validation costs, which GM will do for them or, or coordinate for them, as well as $4 billion in battery and powertrain costs over the next 10 years. 
Uh, so Nicola still plans to deliver the Badger by the end of 2022, and uh, it actually will be produced in a GM plant that is yet to be named, so we don't know where that is. Great news for Nikola. I mean, it's really hard as you've watched Tesla uh, struggle over the first initial years anyway to build a plant and build everything up. Here, partnering with one of the big OEMs that has the manufacturing prowess to help them uh, scale and get that economy to scale quickly. Great. I love to see more competition, especially in that hot, hot SUV and pickup truck market. So congratulations for that and keep watching the uh, Nikola and GM. And speaking of pickup trucks, I can't talk about that landscape without mentioning Rivian. Well, they are actually started production and they're slowly rolling off some vehicles on their production line. These are pre-production units, but they are showing what they can do from a production format. And they're going to be used for continued testing throughout the balance of this year and into next year, where they do hope that they can start deliveries at the beginning or mid to next year. There's not a clear time frame. And of course, with the pandemic, everything is thrown to a kilt on that. Um, but their goal is really to focus on high quality and durability as far as the manufacturing of these uh, SUVs and pickup trucks. So glad to see some progress that Rivian has made to take some steps forward to get product out the door. And kind of the big topic for this show as well, I wanted to leave it near the end, is the Lucid Air reveal that I watched last week. Um, you know, not a lot of, I guess not a lot in there that we kind of didn't know as far as the looks go because they've been dropping teasers and ints for so long, but there were a lot of good stats that were given. And, uh, you know, I guess my surprise is the pricing for the car. It's not going to be a cheap vehicle, but hey, you know, that's the world we live in. Um, some of the highlights that I picked up from the Lucid Air announcement is a couple key things, is that they're keeping everything in house. So they're, they're following Tesla when it comes to the R&D, to the design engineering, the manufacturing, they're controlling those processes as much as they can. You know, they have supplier agreements, they're putting everything together so that they can get these vehicles out in terms of quality, in terms of refinement, and in terms of being able to control the supply chain so that they can meet the demand that they want to as best as they can. So I found that to be an excellent idea for a company that has some backing now. The, the Lucid Air, of course, is a beautiful looking four-door sedan uh, with probably that one of the highest efficiencies that they're claiming out there, they're claiming that it's 15% more than the most efficient vehicle, which I believe is the long range model S, but I could be wrong there. Somebody will t let me know. Um, but they have this smart range. Uh, they, can, they can get over four miles per kilowatt hour. Now the battery pack is, is designed uh, for them as well. Uh, using this Lego type of technology so they can intermix cells and they can change it up on the fly for different options and, comp and configurations. The thermal system is a very reliable and efficient that they've got. Now, one of the things they claim is this is the first 900 volt architecture, uh, 924 to be example volts, uh, which will give an estimate of over 300 kilowatts of fast charging. Now, let's wait and see what it actually shows when people start buying them and, some, and people actually going to try plugging them into 350 cap capable or higher um, DC fast chargers. We'll have to see. They are using cylindrical cells uh, and, and, and unique chemistries in their batteries, which are able to give them really great performance uh, of you know, over, they're claiming over a thousand horsepower on this machine that will, if all things work correctly, give them a sub 10 second quarter, quarter mile. And for people who know cars, that's an awesome number to achieve in a, uh, in a street legal family sedan offering to get sub 10 seconds without having to modify it and all this kind of stuff. Uh, 2.5, zero to 60, so zero to 100 K close anyway, uh, range. Um, everything, and they've done a really nice job of micro uh, icing, slimming down the components to put them into more singular um, inter integral, uh, integral uh, packaging to really give this, you know, when they were talking about the space, spaciousness of the cab inside, I was thinking of Chrysler's cab forward concept, which came out, people are going to nod their heads going, I remember that. It was a unique breakthrough at the time where Chrysler pushed everything out to the ends of the vehicle so that you could open up the, the interior for more occupant room and comfort. And that's kind of what Lucid has done here from the electronics and the components. They've slimmed down the components, moved them out as far as they could, but yet still giving you a trunk, still giving you a frunk, still giving you uh, and, and maintaining a lot of that cab um, 
uh, environment that really makes it comfortable and gives them the ability to do things like this executive seating that they're going to have in one of their models and lounge type of stuff. So it's pretty cool. Even the HVAC has been designed uh, specifically for though their uh, their applications. Um, they've even put in a high bandwidth Ethernet backbone in the vehicle. Uh, they've got 32 sensors, including ultrasonic, radars, they're using LiDAR as well as cameras, and they expect to get a five-star safety rating, both from IHHS and from NCAP. I mentioned the charging speeds earlier, and one of the key components is what they call their Wonder Box or Wunder Box, depending on how you want to pronounce that. That's able to charge uh, from a level two up to 19.2 kilowatt hours uh, on that capacity. It's ultra compact, efficient, and integrated, as I mentioned, um, giving you the, the, that higher volt architecture. And another unique feature that not unique to the market, but unique certainly to many EV manufacturers is bi-directional capabilities. They talked about charging other lucid air vehicles, about putting energy back into your home, V to grid, uh, V to H, uh, all these kind of technologies. Now the factory is gonna be in Arizona. They're gonna build the vehicles there. They are already started construction of that factory and they expect to, uh, to get going. They've got their first retail studio in Beverly Hills and they're gonna open 20 in North America, similar to Tesla stores and so forth. Vehicles will come in three editions. The Dream Edition, which is their first offering at $169,000 US dollars, that is. And then the Grand Touring and then the Touring at 95,000, which is the base and upwards from there for those packages. So um, the most expensive one is gonna start coming on next year. If they wanna get it. You can now put a 1K reservation in. It's all up and running. And that Dream Edition will be limited numbers in 2021. Then those more affordable options, if you think 95K US is affordable, great, uh, good for you. But they'll be coming in 2022 as they ramp up production and scale everything down so they can keep making profits. Um, and lastly, they threw a little, you know, and, and uh, kind of Apple-ish. Oh, and one more thing, this project Gravity, which is their SUV offering. And as you can see by a lot of the pictures and stuff that I'm putting through this, especially this one, looks like a pretty funky looking uh, SUV. And I'm sure it'll be very nice and refined. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that'll be on the horizon, probably a 2022, maybe 2023 offering from them. So they do plan on starting production of their the, the initial Lucid, airs in the spring of 2021 as his factory is almost completed in the next couple of months they'll ramp up and uh, get going so I, I think it's a great success story uh, again of another startup manufacturer that's been able to get keep the funding and, and actually show results so not some that just show renderings and they go around publicizing stuff but actually show results and they show prototypes and they they're working on stuff they're not just sitting around for a year collecting money and doing designs I know that this stuff takes time, but in today's day and age, investors get uh, angsty and, we're, we, we, and they can be impatient. So, um, you know, it's good to really see some results coming from Lucid and I wish them the best of luck. And I can't, you know, wait to actually get my hands on one or to see one live because it is a beautiful looking machine. And last little tidbit here is I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with the CEO of Nano One, a technology company based in Vancouver, Canada, whose mission is to establish its technology as a leading platform from the global production of a new generation of battery material. So they're into that battery supply chain element in many different ways. I talked to Dan Blondell, who's their CEO, a really smart guy, a physicist, an engineer, and happens to be a business guy as well. We had a great conversation about what they're doing and one of the topics we talked about is this million a mile battery approach and I thought I'd throw this in here because in lieu of battery day coming up next week from Tesla that's going to get a lot of airtime and a lot of uh, ears and eyes looking at it so I thought I'd throw this little segment in when we talked about the million mile battery for you to listen to so here you go on the show I have a gentleman by, by the name of Dan Blundell Blundell, who's the CEO and director of Nano One Technologies, or a company based in Vancouver. Thank you, Dan, for taking the time to join me, and welcome to the show. Thanks, Ken. It's great to be on a Canadian show, too. Yeah, thank you for that plug. I'm very proud. There's not many of us that do what I do from a Canadian marketplace. So, uh, you know, with, with Tesla's Battery Day coming up and all the buzz around that, it was great that we were able to hook up and have this conversation to highlight what you folks do and then, and then pick your brain and get your opinion about some of the things going on 
Well, well certainly we're, we're tackling cost effectiveness and, and that's partly through the, through the, the process of how we, how we uh, work in this. I mean, we, we, look at, uh, we look at the raw material supplies. So lithium, of course, comes in various forms. It comes as a carbonate or hydroxide. Nickel comes in the form of a, of a sulfate and, and, and on hydroxides and carbonates. And each one of these have their sort of different properties and, and can be handled different ways at the, at the front end of the chemical process. So we're trying to find ways that uh, help lower the cost of the input materials. We're building um, uh, sort of uh, scaled up designs so that uh, so the volumes can help reduce costs and reduce, we're actually eliminating the waste streams that are common to, to cathode manufacturing. So typically they have these um, sulfate based forms of the metal coming in and the sulfate's a waste. You don't need it, but it's part of the chemical process. And so we found a way to completely eliminate the sulfate. So it kind of, it kind of speaks to the whole need for so environmental sustainability as well. How do you make these materials more durable? And we were, we're designing ways to coat the materials without adding steps and uh, so that they actually last longer. That's really the key. And, you know, that's a great point with, uh, you know, the chatter about, you know, Elon talking about the million dollar, a million mile battery pack, you know, durability is something that more and more people are thinking about. You know, we buy the average internal combustion car, it'll last 10 years. I think most people will agree with that. But a lot of people aren't sure about EVs and the technology, especially the, the cells, the degradation that everybody hears about, you know. Um, so so that mission of, of durability is certainly important. And I think you mentioned as well, also from a performance about trying to to get, you know, bigger bang for less dollar from a battery pack, you know, increased uh, density storage. Is that correct as well? Yes. So, so obviously there's a, there's a, there's this mark of trying to get it under a hundred dollars a kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. And, uh, and that, of course that requires driving the cost down and the performance of all the materials in it, including the cathode material. Um, so uh, on the process side of things, we're trying to drive the cost down, but we're using the process also to improve the, improve the, the kilowatt hour side of the equation. And, and that's not just the amount of energy you use on a day to day basis between charges, but it's also the amount of energy you use over the lifetime of the battery. How many cycles do you get out of the battery before it degrades to a point where it's really not practical to use it anymore. So um, uh, uh, the, the focus for us is largely on, on the durability component. How do you make that battery last longer? And if you can make a, if you can make it last long, yeah, you could turn it into a million mile battery and that'll serve the, that'll serve the fleet vehicles and the bus guys uh, really well. Um, if you shrink that battery way down, it'll also serve the, uh, serve the, the entry level market where the batteries are, are good enough for one day and you have to charge and discharge them really, really regularly. So uh, those are, it, it just makes the battery more robust by making the underlying uh, materials more uh, more durable, and it, it, it can extend the range. It can extend the. Uh, it can actually, you can actually charge the battery faster um, because the material is more durable. It can actually just take a bigger beating, and uh, which means you're not going to lose as much capacity over time by charging it uh, fast. So, so these become really key things for the OEMs and for the car manufacturers to build into their battery packs durability why it really is so important um than uh you know than reaching it's more important really durability than reaching that million miles in battery i think you've kind of touched upon yeah. but is there anything else to add to that no i, I, th I think actually we, it's, it's a pretty quick thought exercise um you know a million mile batteries for the average driver who's doing 40 50 kilometers a year i, I don't know if it's exact math but the last time i worked it out that's 75 years of driving so <laughs> really practically speaking i, I think it's um it makes a great tagline, the million mile battery. And I think and then people understand, oh, this thing's, this thing's gonna last forever. I don't need to worry about it. I can, you know, I can, I can charge it really fast and I don't need to worry about it. So I think it gets the concept across really quickly. Uh, but, the, but really the underlying thing is that it's durable. And it's that durability that, uh, that, can, that can provide, you know, either this super you know, long lasting million mile battery or something that charges in six minutes or something that, uh, um, uh, something you can drive an extra 50 kilometers every day. Uh, you know, these are all the benefits that uh, that will actually trickle down to the consumer. Or, or it might be it might be the, the, the battery that drives the the robo taxi that's uh, that's you know that's on the road for 24 hours a day, as opposed to you and I who drive for you know 30 minutes a day. So yep. that's uh, uh, you know, and those those batteries just need to be more durable. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, that piece of the interview. It was about a 45 50 minute interview. Uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing on the show here. What you can do is go to any podcast app that you have, be it Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, Apple, uh, iTunes, uh, Google Play, 
Um, I'm probably forgetting a couple, or you can check out the website, uh, evrevolution.com, which is my RSS audio podcast feed website, and you can listen to them there. But we, we had a nice conversation. I put that into audio format and uploaded it, so I would suggest if you want to listen to what we talked about in the world of battery technology, we got pretty deep, um, and some of it went way over my head when you got technical, but for those people who like technical, like, you'll get a big bang out of it. But anyway, check it out, and my thanks to Dan again for spending the time with me and educating me on this exciting marketplace. All right, and just before I end the show, I've got one mailbag, <laughs> finally. Uh, once in a while, I get something in from people, and I appreciate that. Uh, and this is from Kevin, who I believe is in the U.S., if I'm not mistaken, Kevin, um, who sent me an email asking about, um, you know, congratulating me about the Model 3. And again, thanks to everybody who reached out to me on, of course, YouTube, on the comments, on Twitter, and different formats, some emails that I received saying congratulations. Thanks, guys. It really means a lot to me. Um, you know, this was a, a really uh, important decision for us to make, and it took some time to make this decision. And that's what kind of Dan's asking me, or sorry, Kevin's asking me. He's saying, you know, can you can you talk a little bit more about your delivery experience and the quality and, you know, the driving experiences versus, versus, versus the Nissan Leaf? He's got a Leaf and, you know, what charger I'm using at home and that kind of stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about that now that I've, I've been able to spend a few days with my own Model 3. As I mentioned on the uh, uh, surprise video, the delivery, ex the, the delivery experience was very smooth, and uh, especially under um, COVID conditions, it's fairly contactless. We did communicate, but um, uh, and basically, and the uh, uh, delivery uh, person did show me a couple of things on the uh, uh, setting up, uh, you know, my uh, key cards and all that kind of stuff that they were running, but most of it was contactless. We just spoke from a distance, and I knew what to look for. I took a list with me. There's lots of information that you can download, forms, all this stuff. People have great ideas as far as taking a list and checking it off, uh, making sure you cover these things. So I was able to look through the car um, and and really, you know, pick out uh, the, the minor couple of things that I mentioned on that episode. But the experience was fantastic. They were very nice. They let me put the front plate on, which took longer than I thought, as I mentioned, so that was really nice. And it was inside, so we weren't really bothered with the wind and the sun even though it was not a bad day but it was nice to be inside and it was fairly quiet there weren't a lot of people the quality as I mentioned it was excellent I know going in that there's going to be some issues and since then I have picked up a couple of small issues so I'm getting a bit of wind noise from the driver's side top of the of the glass uh, towards the uh, rear view mirror on the driver's side I, I just don't think the door is either pressed up enough against the seal or the seals may be a little thin because I once I get over 70 80 kilometers an hour I can hear the wind noise so it is pretty prevalent it's not howling but it's noticeable again in a car that's very quiet and the other issue I had was there was a small paint blemish that I did not pick up on delivery day I think because I was under ultra uh, 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 you know fluorescent lights in a in a warehouse type setting that I couldn't really I didn't really look and you're a little excited and you're trying to look around and I did take some time but you know you can miss things so there was a little paint blemish where it looks like there might have been a little nick and they put some touch-up paint on it but they didn't gloss it over so in the I, in one morning I got up and I went to the car and I noticed this kind of dull little dull patch over the front um, uh, tire on the driver's side on that that fender and I noticed a little dull patch and I looked and I could see that it was painted over but it wasn't glossed over it so maybe it just needs to be buffed out or put a coat of something on it, whatever. So I have scheduled online uh, through the app, which is great with Tesla. You schedule your service appointments and I have to I have an appointment at the end of the month where they're also going to install the home link because I purchased the home link system uh, before I got the vehicle. And that includes the, the that price includes the installation of it. Uh, so that's that's what uh, the experience has been from a quality. Otherwise, everything's been great. I've had no other issues. Um, the driving experience. Well, that's going to be a hard one to keep in a couple of minutes because I don't want this show to go too long. But they are relatively night and day. Uh, the Tesla Model Three handles a lot differently than the Nissan Leaf. You do feel that center of gravity in both vehicles, but uh, Model Three is a wider vehicle. A little bit lower stance as well with bigger tires, so it is going to handle much differently than the Nissan. Now, the Nissan was very nimble, very quick to get around. Model 3 is a little bit more laborious, but not like a you know big old Lincoln or something like that. It does zip around quite nicely. The acceleration, of course, is much higher. Uh, in the Model 3 versus the Nissan, but I actually run it in chill mode because I don't want that hard acceleration. If I need to go, it's got more than enough power to go. So um, I'm not worried about that. So as far as that, it's more roomy. Um, again, I'm, I got really used to the single display 
within really about 10 minutes. It didn't take me long to get used to it. What charger am I going to be using for, for home? Well, I already had the Tesla wall charger that I've been using for my Nissan Leaf for the past two and a half years. And because I've wired it to a 60 amp circuit, I'm able to pull the full 48 amp that the Model 3 can draw. But hopefully, Kevin, that answers your questions. And as I get more experience and more relevance with my Model 3, I'll be able to tell you more. All right, Whew, I'm out of breath now. That's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks very much for watching. I appreciate it, of course, on YouTube. Uh, really, really thankful for everybody who comments. Please, if you haven't subscribed, please do. It's very important to YouTubers, as you know, to have those numbers. I really would appreciate it. Thanks for all the comments and keep them coming in. I love to, love to read that, your suggestions, your ideas, all that stuff. I've had some people say, hey, you got a Tesla? I'm really surprised. I thought you hated Tesla. No, I don't hate Tesla, but I am, I, I am and I can be critical of them and as I am of other OEMs in the marketplace and other companies of, of and I'm not the I won't hesitate to criticize Tesla if I feel that it's that I should criticize them for something so that doesn't mean I hate something because I criticize it right um, so remember that folks also patreon supporters you know who you are thank you very much I'm always humbled with that it really really super helps me folks of course everybody stay safe uh, winter's coming Things uh, may get worse before they get better again. You, you you can watch your own news and make your decisions. Please follow public health guidelines, of course, and continue to watch the EV marketplace. We got battery day coming up. A VW ID4 reveal is coming up this month. Uh, I'm probably missing another announcement as well. It's a pretty busy time for the electrified community, so I hope you continue to watch. And on that note, again, everybody stay safe. And until the next show, I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye bye.